Welcome back for another episode of the Dr. Bo Show. Today, we're talking about breathing and running. <clears throat> it's a uh, it's a common topic to be discussed in all sorts of formats, uh, blogs, magazines, on your run when you're already out of breath. What got me all hot and bothered, uh, what ruffled my skirt, uh, put my panties in a bunch, I don't know any other euphemisms to any other way to say it, but it got me a little riled up. Um, it was a magazine article that came out and we're gonna talk about that article in a second. But first of all, I wanna just chalk up some bullet points on why uh, the way we breathe while we're running is so important. Obviously it's a cardiovascular aerobic based exercise, but there's a lot more to it than that. So it boils down to this, improve mechanics, improve metabolic control, Right? I think those two are, make a lot of sense. And then parasympathetic dominance or state control, we may say the mental game. So those three things are really what we're going to go after in this video, uh, trying to parse out some of the myths, some of the misconceptions, and some of the things that may still be unknown, um, which is most of the realm of science, but the best uh, held knowledge that we currently have. So let's get into it. So this is the article of the most recent uh, Trail Runner magazine. I'm a huge fan of Trail Runner magazine. Um, and in this article, it says core issue. Instead of a six pack runner should focus on functional core and trunk stability to improve durability and running economy. That statement right there, fantastic. Give it a double thumbs up. But when we break down the article, uh, here's a quote specifically. It says on your next run, spend the first few miles like normal then every couple of minutes, focus on engaging your transverse abdominis. In parentheses, cinch up your corset. That was their parentheses, not mine. This is where, you know, the, the wheels come off, the trains off the track, uh, all other, I'm going to try to say as many analogies uh, as I can or euphemisms in this podcast. That's one of my goals besides learning you something. Um, we're learning together. That's really what's going on but this is just wrong. It's not, this is not an opinion based thing. This is wrong based on both empirical evidence, but also anecdotal experience from my patient base, uh, the runners that I work with and then myself. Uh, so let's get into it. Abdominal bracing. So when we talk about that cinching up the core set, the activation of transverse abdominis, this thought process has been around for thousands of years, right? That this is a, something we do need to be able to control, right? Transverse abdominis is a great uh, you know, torso stabilizer or stiffener, um, bracing while doing something that has a fatigue base to it over a long period of time, probably isn't a good idea. If you think about it, if you tried to flex your bicep all day, your elbow and your shoulder may seem really solid and stable. Your bicep fatigues when it fatigues, what happens? You're not able to withstand the loads that you even could withstand normally with your bicep, let alone after hours of cinching up your corset. Um, but then it gets into the mechanics of breathing, the physiology of breathing, and then also state control. But this picture, if you're not watching, this is just somebody hollowing out their abdomen, which is the classic, you know, we think my wife wrote an article called uh, navel to spine, you're out of your mind. That's kind of the idea here that you're drawing your stomach in your uh, creating this hollow. So very famous physical therapist, uh, Carol Levitt said, if breathing is not normalized, no other movement pattern can be. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, obviously a way smarter guy than me, but this is, he was talking in terms of injury or movement dysfunction. Now we're dealing with running. Like this becomes paramount that we have to, uh, A, if we're going to build an aerobic base, we're going to create better endurance. Why do we not think it's important to kind of, finagle with or get the nuances of the thing that would pump the oxygen into our body, the, the respiratory system on point, instead of just thinking that we're training our body to become a better aerobic output machine seems really backwards to me. So not to toot my own horn. And I told you I love trailer Runner magazine, but years ago, this from 2014, feel a little old. That was man, seven years ago. It's crazy. Uh, I wrote an article for trail runner that was called the forgotten muscle. Uh, you know, the, the picture they put in here, if you're watching is a picture of the lungs highlighted. 
they should have went just below that and highlighted the thoracic diaphragm is really what I was talking about because you have to be a bit singular in these articles. But in this article, I dive into all the things that we're about ready to talk about. Uh, the mechanics, physiology, and state of breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, intra-abdominal pressure, all these things. And I even give some practical tips. We're going to talk about that today too. So this intra-abdominal pressure, it, just think it's the exact opposite of sucking in your stomach. You're creating pressure from the inside out, which is intra-abdominal pressure, which then creates what is lovingly referred to, I don't know why it's so lovingly, as the zone of apposition. So the zone of apposition is where all of these forces, if you remember way back to physics, uh, Boyle's law says as we decrease volume, we increase pressure, right? If you push on something, you increase the pressure. Well, as your thoracic diaphragm descends, which would happen on an inhale, you increase the pressure, which increases the pressure outward. You can also increase this pressure through a slight move um, or a dialed down version of like a Valsalva. If you kind of bear down, that's a bit of a intra-abdominal pressure increase. If you, my daughter, who's 11 months old, if you go feel her abdomen, even though she doesn't have a whole lot of muscular development yet, she's gonna have adequate intra-abdominal pressure 360 degrees around her abdomen because that's how we're designed to stabilize from a, uh, a uh, normotypical evolutionary basis, right? That's built into everybody. When we see that this pattern goes away in small children, which happens in about 30% of kids, that's considered pathologic. Why is it not considered pathologic when we get uh, to adulthood, start running, somebody comes in, they have back pain or they're, uh, they seem like they should be fit, but they keep experiencing this inability to uh, increase aerobic fitness or they have things like exercise induced asthma. A lot of it goes back to how they're breathing, the actual mechanics of this thing that then affect physiology and state. Um, and then, you know, the anatomical positions that can make this uh, easier or harder, right? If we look at this first picture, if you're not watching, it basically shows your thoracic diaphragm and your pelvic floor are parallel to one another. That creates the ability to uh, sustain a really good zone of apposition. So we can create intra-abdominal pressure a little bit easier. When we get into these heavily extended states or lumbar spine, which you're, you know, I lovingly say that's J-Lo versus kind of this John Wayne tucked under, um, it gets a little harder because we create this open scissor, which again, if you push on a balloon and you push on the back of that balloon, you're going to um, kind of get a, 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 a bubble in the front of that balloon. That's what's happening, that you create excess compression on the spine and then excess force through the anterior abdomen, which you can see in extreme cases is kind of what happens with diastasis recti or diastasis recti allows that to happen to easier kind of chicken or egg there. And with this runner, you can see, um, obviously this is somebody running on a track. You're going to see most people that are mid distance to sprinters live in this kind of extension compensation position because it's actually advantageous as a runner to be able to maximize hip torque to maximize hip extension and if you can throw in a little bit lumbar spine action with it you're going to get a little bit more but you do sacrifice some of the aspects of your lumbar spine you start to beat up the passive aspects like ligaments and discs and things like that um, which can create pain but if we do this with adequate intra-abdominal pressure it's going to be a little less intrusive than without and somebody again way smarter than me all the way back in 2005 a guy named Paul Hodges said, stiffness of the lumbar spine is increased when intra-abdominal pressure is elevated, right? We've already said that. Why did I point out this little snippet from Hodges? Paul Hodges was the guy that originally, uh, he didn't do the original research per se on the activation of transverse abdominus that was really hot back in like 70s, 80s, um, like when Pilates came about and things like that. But he was the guy that popularized it because he looked at transverse abdominus action so much and then started publishing his own data and speaking about it a lot. But then when new data came to light, as happens quite often with science, he said, whoa, 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 maybe the best way to stabilize the spine is through adequate intra-abdominal pressure. It's not the cinching of the core set, this activation of a prime mover, right? A phasic muscle um, to create stability, especially over the long term in these endurance-based activities. Why is it also important? Like we pointed out with that runner a couple slides ago, this article says causal effect of intra-abdominal pressure on maximal voluntary isometric hip extension. Uh, it says the current results suggest that I, oh, let me back up here, sorry. 
suggests that IEP intra-abdominal pressure has a positive causal effect on hip extension uh, as maximal voluntary isometric contraction, MCV torque, and that a sufficient increase in IAP directly leads to an enhancement of hip extension MVC torque. Basically, if you have adequate intra-abdominal pressure, you can push off of your, push through your hip better, right? And anybody that is involved in the least bit in the sprinting world knows that one of the biggest keys to a good sprint athlete is your ability to push a little bit harder than your competitor more often, um, and that makes you go faster. What else we got? So the effects, here's another research article, the effects of dorsal lumbar motion restriction on energy use and center of mass of movement during running. Long title. So I'm gonna highlight this. It says, we hypothesize that less movement of the center of mass vertically can affect stride length, lead to more strides being used to cover a specific distance and thus could contribute to earlier onset of fatigue and overuse injury. More research needs to be done on this topic. You may be like, whoa, whoa, what are we talking about here? They put people in a thermoplastic cast. Uh, so they basically made them have a rigid torso. Um, do a test if you're listening to this. Flex, right? Or hollow your transverse abdominus. Or if you can't, make a, a bicep and then try to move joints around that bicep fluidly. When you're in a uh, concentric contraction of a muscle, you don't have a whole lot of, you don't have a full range of motion. Um, you don't have the greatest amount of control when you're in a full contraction, but you also fatigue. So you fatigue uh, motor units, which over time uh, creates a, a whole plethora of things. Uh, so that's what this article to me is kind of pointing out that if we stiffen somebody's lumbar spine, they're going to create more movement in different planes, but then that creates a, uh, obviously less efficiency. If we can create good stability, but then still create better mobility, right? Controlled, we call it, that's where dynamic stability comes from, or this dynamic neuromuscular stabilization that we're able to move better through the strategies of stabilization that we choose. Um, and this is just that quote that I just highlighted. And, you know, when we talk about all this intra-abdominal pressure and creating pressure in the abdomen, I think a lot of people revert to thinking of, you know, this is a picture of a power lifter with a, you know, big leather belt on the big keg belly that, you know, you have to create this massive amount of pressure. That's not really what we're talking about. We're not talking about this all out max lift, hundred percent pressure. What I'm talking about is the ability to maintain pressure around the cylinder of your core to then allow yourself to create for running specifically here, to create torque. So I have a picture of uh, one of my running crushes up right here. And as we can see that she's twisting around her center axis, you can literally see how her feet literally cross midline. We're not saying that's happening at landing, but it's happening as she's in flight right here. And oh my God, her arms are crossing over as well. Um, your center of mass, your, your spine, the center of your body is like a, a drive shaft for a runner. And a drive shaft on a car spins in, if we're a human, it spins in the transverse plane or the rotational plane, but a car does what? It goes in the sagittal plane, it goes forward and backwards. That's a human running. And if we don't have good intra-abdominal pressure to then use the muscles around the cylinder of our core, our hip, our spine, our shoulders, we're not gonna create a lot of torque. We're gonna create a lot of stiffness, which leads to fatigue and it leads to a lot more uh, need for muscular endurance. You're going to have to push harder with each stride because you're not allowing yourself to use the elastic recoil of your body. I always tell people it's like you're wringing out a wash rag and then letting it go with every step that it just kind of springs back. And again, how do you work on this stuff? We have tons of videos on our YouTube channel. We also now have an app. Um, so you can you know, get after all this stuff. Uh, and I'm kind of doing a little plug if you're watching here, how you can go into the app and look for videos. There's tons of videos, not just mine out there that talk about how to work on intra-abdominal pressure, um, how to then use that in different drills, DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. This is the cornerstone, right? So I really encourage you go look up my video, download our app, start working on this and see if you can just start incorporating it at a low level into a daily task, but also exercises, not necessarily running yet. We're going to talk about that in a second. 
Interesting note here, uh, if you're not watching, this is a picture of one of the Tara Umara runners. There's a lot of misconceptions that got drawn up with uh, Christopher McDougall's 2009 book, Born to Run. But one of the interesting notes that does hold water is that this isn't just the Tara Umara. Many Native American cultures are uh, known for when their babies breathe with their mouth open, that they will close their mouth. Right. And uh, when a lot of uh, white people came to America and interacted with early Native Americans, Native Americans tended to call them black teeth because of the amount of uh, obviously bad dental hygiene, uh, which they correlated to breathing through a mouth, which isn't too far off. But when Christopher McDougall's gang, um, all these runners started going down to hang out with Taru Mara runners, it's noted in that book that they kind of thought that these people were sick when they went out and ran because they were heaving through their mouth and they wondered why they wouldn't breathe through their nose. It was probably because they weren't well trained at it. So what are we getting after here? And here we have uh, Ilya Kipchoge. This is at mile 17 of the Nike sub two project. And you can see he has his pacers. I don't know the exact mileage that the pacers ran, but they came in and out numerous times. I want to say they ran around five, six miles, maybe even less. Everybody else mouth open, breathing. You can see this guy, just a master of state control using nasal breathing, tapping into his diaphragm really well. So why are we talking about this? Well, your ability to create intra-abdominal pressure and diaphragmatically breathe can be heavily influenced by nasal breathing. So why? So increased resistance increases vacuum in the lungs resulting in 10 to 20% increase in oxygen transport. This is from 1987. So just breathing in through your nose, we're defaulted. Do this if you're sitting there listening, take a deep breath through your mouth. I guarantee you feel your shoulders rise, your chest fill up. Now exhale, take a big breath through your nose you're going to feel a little more abdominal kind of shift there. That's how we're designed. You're going to fill up the upper lobes of your lungs more. You're going to get better perfusion through the lower lobes of your lung because of this vacuum effect that gets created with the air moving over um, the turbinades and uh, all of the different passages through your nose. Uh, like I said, we're hardwired. We get a boost or a release of nitric oxide when we breathe through our nose, which is a potent vasodilator. Think of the things in your pre-workout mix. Uh, that right there allows what? If we vasodilate, we have more room in our vascular system through our arteries to then move blood, which would be very important if I'm an aerobic athlete to be able to shuttle blood as fast as I can. But it also actually helps deliver oxygen to the tissues a little bit better too. It's not just about vasodilation crucial for restful sleep. You've never met a snorer who isn't breathing through their mouth. I guarantee you that. And again, we're just designed this way. When you breathe through your nose, you warm, humidify, and purify the air. Going back to that picture of the Taru Mara runner, think about their, their environment, their climate. It's very arid. It's dry. It's dusty. So for them, that may be part of that of why they think somebody's sick. Like it makes no sense to breathe through your mouth because they need to humidify the air to uh, get the particulate matter out of the air. The, uh, the flip side of the coin is things like exercise induced asthma. You know, we have people that when they run in particular in cold weather, they get asthmatic, you know, either a asthma attack or asthmatic symptoms. If you talk to a lot of pulmonologists or exercise physiologists, they don't think this should actually, uh, exercise induced asthma should be a diagnosis. It should be a dysfunctional label that the way that you breathe leads to more dysfunctional breathing, the harder you breathe and the harder you work, leading to things like bronchoconstriction that look similar to asthma, but are really not. It's a dysfunction run amok. Uh, so how would you work on that? You work on your breathing. And again, another quote, Leon Chaitao, very brilliant physiotherapist, has a great book, Recognizing and Treating Breathing Disorders. If you're a doc, you got to go read it. Uh, but he says, thus the amygdala reigns over the body like an ever vigilant watchdog. So now we're getting to talk a little bit about, um, you know, less of the physiology, more of the state control that, you know, the amygdala is where we, it's been postulated a lot of our fear response is taking place. Um, and this is in Leon Chaitao's book about breathing because he's saying that breathing is one of our best regulators for state control for the human. Tim Noakes from 1977 was talking about this stuff that now is very popular. If you've read uh, Alex Hutchinson's book, Endure, 
talks about the central governor theory that a lot of our centrally mediated fatigue factors are actually what drive us to fatigue rather than peripheral fatigue factors like running out of ATP, glucose, glycogen, uh, you know, small muscle uh, damage, things like that. Like those things occur and those may have a feedback loop, but it's really like, how do we get that last kick at the end of a marathon? It may be due to this. Well, if we can override or have better control of our state, maybe we don't get into some of those, you know, bonks or we hit the wall or, uh, you know, in training, we learn how to kind of up the mental and the state training based on how we use our breathing in and out of running. Uh, I'm going to credit Brian McKenzie with this. Maybe he got it from somebody else, but he made it popular. So talking, you know, one of the questions I get when we talk about nasal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, and then we get into like, how do you put it into running is like, well, what do you do? You just go out and breathe through your nose the whole time. It's like, not necessarily, but if you think about zone training and we know that you know, 80 to 90% of our training uh, maybe should be spent in this kind of zone two, zone three range because we need this really easy training to build a good aerobic engine. But most of us spend too much of our time in these upper ranges. Maybe a better gauge for when you're spending time in these lower aerobic zones is how you're breathing rather than heart rate, which we know is not a great feedback mechanism for a lot of reasons. Uh, the, the hardware, that we're using cardiac drift, uh, heart rate variability things due to medication, like all sorts of things. Um, and then you look at pace, pace is not a good uh, uh, feedback loop for using training for most people. So one of the things that's become very common is rate of perceived exertion that was popularized by Tim Gabbett. But then that zero to 10 scale of RPE, yeah, there's a pyramid of, hey, it's this hard, it's this hard, it's this hard. But maybe it's easier to say, hey, you got these, these gears. So first gear is nasal only, which is absolutely going to put you into zone one, zone two. It could put you into a lower zone if you have actual breathing dysfunction, right? But if you breathe relatively well, this is going to slow you down and put you into that zone normally. And then what you'll see is you'll be able to speed up once you accommodate for it. Again, that's how we're geared for the most part. Zone two would be nasal in mouth out this may be a little more common right this is zone two that this is how we have to do this because one of the things that is also you know we get this polarized view of things nowadays that if people as people have talked about breathing more and more which breathing has been talked about for thousands of years it just gets recycled um every once in a while uh is that we think that we should be nasal breathing the entire time we're working out whether it's crossfit or running or whatever that's not the case. As you build up excessive carbon dioxide, you need to off gas carbon dioxide faster than you take in oxygen because carbon dioxide is the driver uh, in the midbrain for how often and how deeply we breathe. So it's good to be able to off gas efficiently, but again, being able to breathe in through your nose, exhale through your mouth is gonna do what? When we breathe in through our nose, we get all those benefits we talked about earlier, and those are all crucial for good athletic performance. Now. Third gear, it's how we can get it done. This is going to happen, uh, especially if you're sprinting, you're doing threshold workouts, things like that. But what do we also see those things uh, occur in? A short time window. So we're not doing those for a very long time. So there's not a learned behavior aspect there, but also the buildup into those, right? And how we breathe getting in and out of that really hard third gear matters. Now, why, is, why are these called gears? And why is there a person riding a motorcycle behind here or a dirt bike? Well, if you've ever ridden a dirt bike and you ride the same gear all the time, so say you're always in second gear, you're going to burn that gear out. That's what we see what a lot of people do in aerobic training or endurance training. They get stuck in this second or third gear and that's all they do. They don't know how to downregulate, how to control their state. And then you literally like you lose your ability to build more aerobic base. So your, your sand castle is uh, Steve Johnston or sorry, not Steve Johnston. Steve House and oh gosh, I'm blanking. Uphill athlete guys would say you're saying castles getting flattened, right? You're killing your ability to maintain your aerobic base at that point. And then it gets into this. We have another research article here that says impact loading and locomotor respiratory coordination significantly influence breathing dynamics in running humans. So this locomotor respiratory coupling or phase locking is where, you know, People want to talk about like, well, should you, you know, breathe in for three strides and breathe out for two strides, four to one, um, whatever it is. 
I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't matter because what this article says is you're going to self-regulate over time. And the self-regulation is crucial if two things occur. If your breathing function is normal and if your movement is normal. What do I mean by that? We've talked about the breathing function, movement normality. And normal is, you know, that, that's a bit of subjective, but normal we're saying, can you move through your rib cage, your thoracic spine, your cervical spine, uh, your diaphragm excursion, do all these things move normally? Because if they don't, what we're going to see is the locom locomotor respiratory coupling or this phase locking becomes what we would call parasitic uh, movement or motion where you're actually going to start to use your movement to breathe. So imagine somebody that's heaving, having a, a panic attack an inhale is going to look like they're trying to stand up and exhale is going to be bending forward. So extension of the spine is an inhale, flexion is an exhale. That's where you're going to see that your body, you start to use movement to breathe. That's not how humans are built. We're actually a rarity, right? I might have to turn down my volume here. So humans are not meant to use their movement per se, their body mechanics to draw breath in and out. Now, if you look at, there's a video playing right now with a cheat on the left and Usain Bolt on the right. And I'm going to play this a couple of times that if you look at the cheetah go through its motion, it's going to go through a massive amount of spinal flexion or whole body flexion, which is a what exhale. And then they extend their spine, which is an inhale. All mammals have a diaphragm. They're using their diaphragm, but they're using these gross spinal mechanics to influence the movement of the diaphragm. Humans are the only mammal, probably owe homage to our uprightedness on this one, that can differentiate our diaphragmatic movement from the rest of our body, which makes part of the reason that makes us such good endurance athletes. Um, so just realize that if we see somebody that's moving excessively in maybe the transverse or sagittal plane while they're running, they may be doing so because of one of those two things, breathing functions off or movement function or both. It's not just a learned behavior or bad running form, right? It could be because of something. And I would say normally is because of something. Well, I hope you took all that in. And this is just a little quote that I end most of my talks with that knowledge is only as, power, as powerful as the action it inspires. And I like the inspires part for this little pun there. Uh, because I could tell you all this stuff. If you don't put it into action, it doesn't matter an iota. So I would just take one thing, right? Maybe you work on this stuff at your desk. Maybe you work on it on your next run. Maybe you work on it in cross training. Maybe you use breathing to downregulate. Like I said, there's a ton of breathing info out there nowadays. A lot of good stuff. A lot of stuff's fluff. You just got to kind of weed through it. I think our stuff's really good. So go download the app, uh, check out you know, chirofarm.com, foxruncoach.com, bowbeard.com. There's a lot of good stuff there or the farm app. I hope you guys learned something. If you have questions on this topic or any other topic, you can always get a hold of me on social media at Dr. Bo Beard. And I really appreciate you guys listening. And as usual, if you don't mind, uh, give us a review. Five stars is awesome, but that allows us to get, uh, you know, this episode out to more people and uh, just keep making people better than before. See you guys next time.